Let's now get back into the running back position, folks. So continue those questions, continue the interaction. It's so good to see so many of you legends. It's time, baby. When I see some of those names pop up, you know you know it's training camps in the air and the buzzes in the air, but when I see some of you classic fans, it's like, yes. That, that's why I do it, to see my guys uh, and, and, all the, and all the regular ladies. I'm looking for Sarah, all you people that always come to the broadcast. Get on back over here. We are back. It's time to go. Let's hit the running back position, why don't we? And we'll start with Michael Carter, perhaps my favorite you know, mid-round, like seven, eight-round running back that you can snipe right now. He is running with the ones, according to camp reports, and he's a clear step ahead of everyone around. Now, that's not too hard to do. Who's he got to beat out? Tevin Coleman and Ty Johnson and Michael P. Ryan? Like, he should be a clear step ahead. It is great to hear that he is. And it's great to hear that the coaches aren't playing stupid fucking games with a guy that is clearly ahead of everybody else. They're putting him right in there with the ones, and he's thriving. He's looking great as a pass catcher. Remember, Thor came on our podcast and said, this is the best pass catching back in this class. A lot of people said this guy was better than Javante at USC. Now, a lot of people I think are insane because I think Javante is the best running back in this class outside Najee. That's neither here nor there. Uh, Still, Carter clearly has some talent. He's been running in a zone-blocking scheme his whole life. He had said that after he got drafted. This is the scheme that I was dying to play in. And now that's, of course, carrying over from the 49ers, that Shanahan zone blocking scheme. LaFleur is going to be implementing that. He was tailor-made for this, got the pass catching chops to be a true three-down threat. Sure, the other guys are going to work in, but I absolutely love Michael Carter. I love that he's working with the runs. Uh, So I bumped him into this tier. Now it's tricky. It looks like down. It's not down because he's moved up like 10 spots overall on the big board. Uh, He's only down because I'm going to be bumping up James Robinson. I'm going to tell you why right now. He's looking faster in camp. And yeah, I I get the whole argument. Like, You're not going to get an argument from me against the fact that a new regime comes in, sees what this guy did last year. I mean, this was insane. You were gifted this regime, an absolute stud of an undrafted free agent running back the next few years that you could build around. Look at what he did, 1,414 scrimmage yards, 10 touchdowns, the RB7 in fantasy, played over 90% of his snaps. Like that's only happened a couple times in the last decade, a 90% snap running back. How does he get rewarded? The new regime comes in and drafts a first round running back, Travis Etienne, who I love. I think he's a great talent. And because I'm bumping up Robinson doesn't mean I'm downgrading Etienne. Now let me tell you why. One, all the quotes out of camp are, I'll read it directly line from Jordan Shipley. If the start of Jacksonville's training camp has indicated anything, is that the Jaguars' deep group of running backs are going to get the football, quote, often. And that's in line with everything Urban Myers has always wanted to do with his offense. Daryl Bevel, as a play caller, has always been run-hit, run-centric. Brian Schottenheimer is their pass game coordinator. You want me to remind you who Brian Schottenheimer is? He's the one that we all hate because he won't let Russ cook. Well, he's now gone from there. Thank God. We'll talk about Shane Waldron later. Uh, and now Schottenheimer is their passing game coordinator. His pass plays are probably going to be runs. <laughs> they love to run the ball. And the more and more I've researched it, the more and more I've realized there's going to be enough ground pie to go around for two running backs. And so I still like Travis Etienne. In fact, I bumped him over Javante. We're going to talk about why in a little bit. But I'm bumping up Robinson, and I think I'm going to bump him not above most because I love those 49ers. Edmonds is tricky. I do like Robinson a lot, though. I mean, this is a guy that just looked too good to get removed off the field, even if the draft capital suggests he should. All the quotes out of camp are saying, we love this guy. Uh, He's physical. We love what he can do. He's going to get his fair share of being able to do that, says Darren Bevel. Shipley's predicting he's going to lead the team in in snaps. As we said, looking faster than he was a year ago, primed for another big season. I don't think we're going to get 1,400 total yards again. I don't think we're going to get nearly 90% of the snaps again. I wouldn't be shocked if we get 900-ish in 10 TDs or so. Where he goes, like late eighth, that's a great value. So I think Robinson was someone I was overlooking, someone who I overreacted to a little bit with the dra- drafting of Travis Etienne, uh, who I still, again, as you can see, really like. I like him more than Robinson. I think he brings far more upside as this regime's guy. But I, I was too low on Robinson. That's kind of me admitting it. A. Gibson. Now, here's a guy that I've always been high on, and I'm only getting higher on, as you can see. Right here, bumped up to running back nine, folks. Above Najee, that's a tough one. I love them both. Uh, But he is flying up my big board right on the fringe of that first round uh, 12-13 turn is where he falls. And that's because, uh, one, we have a great interview that's going to be coming out this week with Grant Paulson 
over uh, covers all the Washington sports for sports radio over there. Amazing interview. I talked a ton about how night and day it has been with Antonio Gibson as a receiver, how much more comfortable he looks running his routes, how much more work he's seeing in camp. And now reports are coming out. He was playing in the turbo sets, the, the no huddle offense. That was all McKissick last year. Like I don't even know he sniffed Antonio Gibson the field in any no huddle or two minute situation. This is going to be monumental if he can take over. Probably not all of it. You know McKissick's going to work in for some receiving work. But if that becomes like – McKissick led all running backs with 110 targets last year. If, let's say, 60 of those, you know, they cut it in half, 50-50, and Gibson, who already had about 20, 30 last year, gets now to 70 targets and 45 receptions, 60, you know, 45 to anywhere to 45 and 60, that's going to make this guy an elite running back one. So you cannot ignore these signs that he is going to potentially become the, a light version. Christian McCaffrey, there's no comparison, right? But Scott Turner comes from Carolina and seems to be using Antonio Gibson as his next like Christian McCaffrey light. And this was a guy that was a converted wide receiver that was taking a while to get used to the running back position. There is just so much to love here with Antonio Gibson and all the talk in camp. It, the toe is not a concern, it sounds like. He has just been night and day in his growth and dominating and passing game work. Now run another running back in this tier. You can see he's getting a nice bump up. That's Joe Mixon here. Uh, and <laughs> I can't quit you, Joe. It's like uh, that old broke back mountain. No matter how many times I want to get off him and let me hear it in the comment section. If you're like you, Joe Mixon, fine with me. I won't blame you. This guy has been a nightmare the last couple of years. You see a 40 point day and you see a two point day think this could be the year it stabilizes out. And here's why. Well, Gio Bernard's gone. You should probably know that by now. But in that, they're not looking to replace him at all. All the reports are so far uh, that quote, <laughs> I, I love this one. Joe Mixon has clearly been the best offensive player in camp from the athletic. Coaches have not been shy in talking about how much they will lean on Mixon. Brian Callahan, the OC, isn't interested in any sort of load management. <laughs> no load management. Let all the load fly, baby. I love it. He wants to see as much of Nixon as he can. I love it. And then you talk about the the offensive line coach returning. He was their coach. Uh, Frank Pollock, I think his name is. I, I had it jotted down. I can't see it right now. Uh, he was their offensive line coach two seasons ago when Mixon actually had a consistent year. Not last year, not the year before. Two, uh, two full seasons ago. Uh, when Mixon was having his steadiest, yeah, I think he finishes the RB8 and was pretty dependable all year. It's all lining up, man. It's all lining up. I know Burrow's struggling. I don't buy into that too much. I'm bumping him down a little bit, but ultimately this offense should be highly explosive with that receiving trio they have. The line isn't great. We know that, but they've added beef, so it can't be worse than what it was last year. And Mixon is just looking like a man possessed in camp, uh, looking like he's never going to come off the field, and I'm all here for it. Another guy who might not come off the field at all, that's David Montgomery. He's looking faster, according to reports. In fact, he made speed the uh, focus of his offseason routine, and it looks like it's paid off. All the beat writers are noticing it, but he hasn't lost any. In fact, he maybe has gained strength in his tackle-breaking ability. They're saying nobody can bring him down on first contact. Goal line drills, he broke seven tackles, according to this report. Who knows how hyperbolic it is. But still, the guy is faster. He's breaking tackles regularly. Oh, David Montgomery, what an absolute stud. So you can see here, I'm bumping him above DeAndre Swift. I honestly think I'm even going to go him above Chris Carson at this point. The offense should be way better if and when Fields takes over and Montgomery is setting the tone. Everybody's saying they're looking at him as like the leader, uh, the tone setter in practice, how physical he is, how hard he's working. And he's always kind of been that guy, but they're saying he's taking it to a new level. And Nagy's come out and said, I want to feed this guy at least 20 plus times a game. That's a concern because who knows if we should ever believe a word that comes out of Nagy's mouth. And he's been hesitant to give running backs full workloads. But still, I mean, everything is lining up. Most importantly, perhaps, is Tariq Cohen has not been practicing. He, he's still behind in his recovery. And yes, they signed Damian Williams. He becomes an intriguing sleeper the longer Cohen stays out. Sure, he's going to siphon a little bit of passing game work. But we saw Montgomery can handle all of it and then some. Uh, and the coaches sound like he wants that to be the case this year, especially with Cohen coming along slowly. 
This is huge stuff, guys. I think Montgomery has to be among the biggest risers. The fact that he falls from round four still right now is insanity. It should be going early round three type of workhorse stuff. Uh, maybe mid if that's where he's going to go. But I absolutely love Montgomery and everything that's coming out of camp about him. And one of the other big risers, you might have seen his name there, that's Saquon Barkley. In fact, when it comes down to Antonio Gibson or Barkley, that's going to be a tough decision for me because I love them both. If he's fully healthy, Saquon, once it's locked in that he's in week one, and, you know, I, I have to do it. Like, this is Saquon Barkley we're talking about, guys. 2,000 total yards as a rookie over that, and 90 receptions as a rookie. There's nobody that has this size upside other than Christian McCaffrey. And all the reports are he's now off the PUP and looked great in his first practice. They're now very optimistic that week one is realistic. There are so many reports about how they're bringing him along slowly. They, you know, Week three-ish might be a target date. You, you might be without him for a few weeks. So until I know those aren't true, I'm going to leave him here. I'll bump him above Najee, but below Gibson. Because I still, if I'm doing best ball drafts, I, I'm nervous they might play that slow game. But it is sounding like week one could be very realistic based on how he looked in his first practice back. And you got to keep that in mind. Uh, so Saquon goes you know, from the bottom here to that. And you can probably see there, right there, so might as well hit Mr. Jonathan Taylor. Uh, yeah, not not good. You know, Carson Wentz being out, Quentin Nelson is guard the same injury. Both are expected to miss at least a few weeks to start the year. You can't, you can't like that. And it could go two ways. You know, one, maybe the run game becomes even that much more of a centerpiece in this offense, and Taylor just gets 30 carries. But who's going to be respecting, what is it, Eason? <laughs> Come on. Uh, Sam like Ellinger or something is looking good in practice, their, their six-round rookie. They're not going to have a good quarterback situation, and defenses are going to sell out to stop the run. Meanwhile, Marlon Mack is looking back to full health. Naeem Hines is catching a ton of balls, they're saying, especially from the quarterbacks that are, are very tentative to go downfield right now. It's still, uh, whether it should be or not, in fact, I'll answer that, it shouldn't be a committee. It's still looking like it is. So a couple of those injuries that are really big along the interior of the line and at quarterback, I, I still love Taylor as a player enough to have him like in this running back one range. Like, you know, This is the tier. You're still getting a low end running back one with him, but it's, it's less of him belonging in like this tier of the Kamara's Chubbs and Joneses and, and Ecklers. He falls now to the bottom of the next tier is how I look with that. Uh, another guy that fell in this kind of range is Deandre Swift. As you can see a couple spots down now, I'm seeing him fall to like mid late round four in best ball right now. Now that is a no brainer. I'm still going to hammer that, but there are some concerns. One that he's missed significant time with a groin injury. Um, he's been like dressing, but not actually practicing is what the reports are suggesting. That's obviously not good. Um, and you know, it's a new offense that he's got to be learning. Jamal Williams has been looking good in his absence. They're already saying it's going to kind of be a, a committee. We've already known that, right? Uh, but they're they're comparing them kind of the Kamara and Latavius Murray of the Saints. So that would be a beautiful report. Like, I, who doesn't want help of Kamara? But this isn't the Saints of that those years. This is the Lions who are going to be absolutely atrocious. I think there's going to be a ton of receiving work for DeAndre Swift if and when he finally returns. They vacated the uh, what 65 percent of their targets last year, uh, and they vacated I think another 60 percent of their carries. The volume is going to be available. I just need to know Swift's available there to take it and that he's going to get the majority of it. it. Sounds like it might be closer to like a 55, 45 than we were originally thinking. And to me, that means Jamal Williams might be the sneaky play in this backfield. Uh, but if Swift's continued to fall around four, that's a no brainer. Like you could just continue to do that because there's so much upside. There's top five upside here. Deuce Staley even said, we want to give this guy 25 touches a game. Now you said that about Miles Sanders last year. So fuck off Deuce, but still, uh, I think, you know, you have to keep this in mind, these groin injuries, because he did struggle with injuries last year. Um, and it's training camp where they're supposed to, you know, obviously it's a good time to heal, but still you're trying to install the offense, get yourself acclimated, get used to Jared Goff. I can't love any of these reports coming up. In terms of some more downgrades too, Javante Williams is apparently firmly behind, was the report. Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon is the clear number one in early camp. Now that's a rookie having to earn his stripes is how I view it. I'm not going to overreact by any means, 
But you can see I dropped him a spot here. I'd rather have Etienne, who conversely is catching everything in sight, is uncoverable, being moved all over the place, in sets with James Robinson, right? Give me the guy like that. In fact, I'll bump him over Cream Hunt now the more I talk about him. Instead of the guy that's just clearly the number two running back, only running with the twos, starting to work in a little bit with the threes. And there was a good report from Shermer, like, this guy can do it on all three downs. You see a guy that just gets it. I like that. And I could see by the end of training camp, him being the starter. I truly could. Now, that's why I'm not dropping him too much further than where I have him right here. I'd like to see that happen. I'd like to know he's going to be getting early work. But you were kind of drafting Javante anyways as like your three and hoping that he eventually becomes your two or even one. He has that upside by midseason, right? You weren't drafting him as an immediate, this is my running back two. I cannot wait to start him in week one. So you keep doing what you're doing with him. But I just wanted to note Melvin Gordon has been running ahead of him. Uh, and that's kind of it. Oh, no, the one other big faller at running back. I'm going to bump him down even another spot here. I'm going to – and I'm going to bump I, – I just like Daryl Henderson, so I'm going to bump the Gaskin down. Not because I don't like Gaskin, but bump him down. So I'm significantly, as you can see, already lower on Miles Sanders, and it's just going to keep going down for me. Uh, I – if you've seen the reports, Elliot Shore Parks – of uh, 94 WIP, the radio station out there, expects Sanders and Boston Scott to basically split touches, was the report. Uh, he noted that through seven training camp practices, Sanders had narrowly outtouched Scott, just 35 to 29, and that has since hit. I love this. He, he posted a chart for us <laughs> absolute addicts out here. It was like, I don't know if anybody cares about these things, but here's the preseason reps. Yeah, Elliot, us fantasy absolute nerds would pay some good money if every team did that for us. Uh, so far, though, in terms of total touches, we've seen Miles Sanders get 49 and Boston Scott get 40. Almost an identical split. Now, Miles Sanders saw almost 80% of the work last year, like, what, 79-ish? And he finishes, like, the RB20. So now you cut that to 60%. That's not good. And a new offense that coming over from Sirianni was always a committee guy. Oh, boy, it's getting ugly there. And meanwhile, you know, Boston Scott, why don't we – I don't even know if I have him ranked in my running backs. Let me check here. Let's bump him this guy up. Like This is going to become the late-round running back that I want. Uh, this is too – I think I, I bumped Ronald Jones by accident one day. Um he should be in this range. <laughs> that was not uh, the correct spot for him. But this is where Boston Scott belongs, like right alongside the James Whites. We mentioned Tariq Cohen when we were talking about Dave Montgomery, so why don't we just, like, he's kind of become undraftable. Get out of here. Uh, but, like, the Gio Bernards, the James Whites, those exciting guys uh, as bench dashes at running back, you know? I'm into it. Absolutely into it. I'm going to bump up A.J. Dillon. As well, and Uncle Lenny, I hate the Bucks running back. So like you know, I, there's not many any news on them unless anybody else has seen something. But I just don't like those guys. I'm clearly far lower than them than most. But you can see Boston Scott, an enormous riser uh, in my rankings here, and this seems like the right tier for him, uh, indeed. Now we talked about Taylor. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to add some names to my running back pools that I know aren't in here. One of them is going to be Jarek McKinnon. I just talked about can't quit Joe Mixon. Well, I can't quit Jarek McKinnon. And the reason being, no longer with the Niners, he's actually with the Chiefs, and he's getting first-team reps. So he also belongs, I would say, right in this tier of potential pass-catching you know, options, and especially he's in a more explosive offense. They're saying Daryl Williams got hurt, and since then, McKinnon's had to ch you know, check in with the first team, and all he's done is step up and impress. There's some quotes from Andy Reid saying, you know, this guy is super fast. He brings a speed element that we don't have. Uh, you know, Pat Mahomes has taken notice and called him explosive. Um, the report, in fact, word for word, says the 29-year-old running back took full advantage of his opportunity with the ones. Um, and it was it – was, flying down the field and got hit and stride on a wheel route. Like love that. And they noted that's not something that Williams and, and Clyde Edwards have been asked to do, but they're asking McKinnon to go do it. 
Um, as Reed says, his speed is different. He's quick. He's got a quickness and speed. That's a great change up from what we already have. Uh, he's got great experience to be added to our backfield, right? Uh, he's very impressive in the receiving game. All the types of things you want to hear. I know how frustrating he was last year, but I think it's time we give Mr. McKiss, uh, McKinnon another shot. And the last running back, I don't know if this guy's on my list. Allison is not. So let's get Allison added on in here. He's apparently running as the clear number two in camp and coaches are extremely excited about the bruising style he's bringing. Well, we know Arthur Smith loves his bruisers. Look what he stabbed with Derrick Henry and how many times he fed him. I'm not saying Allison will even sniff the jock strap of Derrick Henry, but there's only Mike Davis and this guy's never held up as the feature back. And I love Mikey D in those quads this year. Don't get me wrong. Still, the number two in an offense that I think is going to be highly underrated. I know they lost Julio, but I love Arthur Smith. I think he's a great play caller, maybe the best, one of the best, brightest young minds in the NFL right now. They're going to be able to put up some points, and I do think Allison could be a big part of that. I think he belongs, you know, not quite in this like high upside, really like these backups tiers, but maybe more so in here. And now, with that being said, uh, JV and Hawkins is running distant third right now. He brings a speed element that that Allison doesn't. So. He rips off a couple long ones in a preseason game, or we hear some reports of him making highlights. But so far, it's been really quiet on Hawkins, an undrafted free agent who I like, who Thor, we had on our side, loves. But he's just not seeing the reps, and he's not really standing out right now, whereas Allison is. So I am going to bump him down uh, just a little bit here. And maybe, again, he, he does emerge. But as of right now, uh, he's falling behind. I also, well, we talked about those Eagles. Gainwell has not been seeing a ton of first team, if any, work, but he's been very impressive with the second team, so it could be a matter of time. So I am going to bump him up as well. And the uh, last sleeper running back here, I'm going to bump. I mean, he's he's kind of right where he belongs. I had bumped him up earlier today. That's Rashad Penny. He slimmed down by 15 pounds. He feels lighter, faster, all that good stuff. But more so, he's involved. He's active. There's no Carlos Hyde this year. He's the, uh, the you know, Carlos Hyde 20, 30% of the workload for as long as we've got a healthy Chris Carson. And he's missed time in every single of his professional season. So there could and probably will be a world where Rashad Penny takes over uh, for a couple of games, right? And this offense should be just as good, if not better, under Shane Waldron with Russ now being officially allowed to cook. Could be more scoring chances. Uh, and they're saying that Penny is just thriving, looking faster, looking meaner, like just he, he's finally motivated and healthy and ready to get after it. So in your last rounds, I mean, why not? When you're where you're looking at these types of guys, right? Why not go in for him? So I like uh, I like Rashad Penny. It's a potential flyer. What, what is up, you fantasy wolf? Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, share your thoughts in the comments, check out some more videos, and join the newest Wolfpack by subscribing below. Ooh.